Next, we have a couple of tools to do things over the network. Uh, you may recall we uh, used, as an example, I showed you how to build your own web browser to download to get a file via HTTP uh, in, in the shell. But this was a, a very simple form of HTTP and the full protocol uh, is much more sophisticated, so better use a, a proper library rather than doing it yourself. And there are two tools uh, and also in the case of curl an associated uh, C library that many other environments use to access files over the web. And if you just call the curl tool, if you write curl and followed by a URL, then it will retrieve the file behind that URL via the HTTP protocol or other protocols. It supports also FTP, IMAP if you want to access emails, for example. And by default, just write the file that it has retrieved to standard output, um, which you then can redirect into some other file name. You can also specify a destination file name with minus O or potentially slightly um, to be used with caution if you use minus capital O the HTTP command can indicate what the file is called on the server and then you with minus capital O it will be saved with the same name same name that the file has on the server um, this works fine if you trust the server to not do anything nasty and if um, the file is just a static file and the file name that you have on the server will be useful to you as well. But if the file is doesn't really exist as a file, if it's the output of a script, then you may have a somewhat odd file name. There may not be a really useful file name and then curl just uses the last string on, on the URL and that may not be representative of, of the entire content. Um, wget is a very similar tool. It differs from curl uh, by if you uh, write wcat url it will immediately do the same thing that curl does with minus o namely just write in uh, whatever file name was received uh, the content onto the disk um, it has many more options to make copies of entire websites in particular there's an option minus r to recursively go through a website it will scan the html files that it encounters it will uh, look in there for URLs and then it will recursively download those URLs as well. And there are lots of options where you can decide how deep you want to download, whether you want to follow to other servers or not and so on. Sometimes it can be quite useful to have a um, web browser inside a terminal, for example, to get a plain text representation of a website and there are a couple available. Lynx is one of the older ones. Um, W3M is a slightly newer one. Uh, in fact, the very first web browser that I used in 1991 uh, was called Line Mode Browser by a guy called Tim Berners-Lee who invented the web at CERN. It, it started out as a command line tool uh, and later as a graphical user interface for the next computer. Lynx is Historically interesting because today you are being pestered by all these uh, cookie warnings uh, which the server generates, which I think is a not very useful idea. If people want to have control over whether the cookie should be saved or not, the browser should ask that question, not the server. But the uh, politicians uh, unfortunately decided to do it the wrong way around, possibly because they have never used Lynx, because Lynx asked for cookie permissions locally in the browser already in the mid 90s. SSH is a uh, cryptographic version of an older tool called RSH, a remote shell, that allows you to uh, log into another computer over the internet, over a TCP connection, in a similar way into which originally people logged into distant um, computers via terminals and serial port lines. Um, you can either just provide a host name or your the username at the remote system and the host name where you want to log in, or optionally, this gives you an, 
an interactive shell or optionally you can specify a command then SSH will run in non-interactive mode and it will just run the command at the other end. It will connect standard input of the command with your local terminal or standard input of the SSH command and it will connect um, standard output of the command with standard output of uh, the SSH command here. Um, and it also can preserve the distinction between standard output and a standard error when the command is executed uh, remotely. It has lots and lots of other very useful options. For example, if you're using the X-Window protocol, then um, you can forward the X-Window protocol with option capital X. Uh, it can be used as a kind of VPN network where you can forward individual uh, TCP IP ports with options like minus L or minus R. It can be used as a um, as a proxy server with option minus D. Uh, so uh, it's very useful to have a, a detailed look at the uh, full manual of the SSH command. By default, SSH uses the same login mechanism that uh, a local terminal would use, namely you are asked for username and password, but you can also use SSH in a number of uh, password-free authentication techniques. Um, one of them is you can create a cryptographic uh, public-private key pair. Um, the way you do this is you create with SSH keygen a pair of magic data and one of these you keep as a secret. This is your secret key or private key here and that will normally be saved in your local directory tilde.ssh id underscore and the name of the public key uh, cryptography that's being used in this case the rsa algorithm and there is also a file uh, called id underscore rsa.pub that's the corresponding public key and the way public key cryptography works is whoever has access to the public key can challenge you to participate in a cryptographic protocol whereby you can prove whether you have the corresponding secret key. So you can give other people the public key and then they can let you in after you have proven to them that you have the secret key without you actually telling them what the secret key is. So you protect the secret key like a password and you can allow, you can log in on other uh, machines without actually depositing your secret password there. Um, the way you normally do this is on the remote machine, you create in your home directory a folder.ssh and that contains, there you put a file called authorized keys and you want, you place in the authorized key files, uh, file all the public keys uh, with which you want to be able to log into that machine. And normally on each of your devices, you have a secret key and then the corresponding public key you spread on all the servers that you want to log in. Unfortunately, this doesn't work quite so well on the uh, MCS Linux uh, system uh, for which we give you a remote login session because that keeps its file system on a Windows server um, and the, so your home directory is on a Windows server and the uh, entire home directory including the authorized key files will actually only be visible to the server after you have logged in. So there's no password free login for the first session but once you have logged in and your home directory is available and then you want to start further sessions uh, then public key will work. SSH is used not only on its own, but it's also used as a secure, authenticated and encrypted communication tunnel by lots of other tools. These tools under the hood call SSH and then you communicate with uh, another version of the tool at, at the other end by just passing data on via standard input and standard output. One of these uh, tools will see several later as well, is rsync, which is a essentially an improved version of the copy command. It allows you to 
copy files or entire directory trees from some source to the destination, but it will automatically use SSH in order to make this copy remotely to another machine if asked to. So you can prefix either the source or the destination or even both with hostname colon or user at hostname colon and then rsync will ssh as that user to that hostname will call uh, the rsync command at the remote end as well and then uh, use a very clever algorithm to find out which of the data that you want to copy to the destination is already there and then it will only transmit the difference so rsync is an extremely uh, effective uh, backup tool if you want to keep a file tree mirrored on another machine you just use rsync like a copy command but it will not each time copy all the files over it will uh, with relatively little overhead find out uh, what files are locally newer than on on the remote end and then uh, move only added or modified files over um, like the copy command, it has a number of uh, options. How much of you want to copy over? Do you want to copy entire subtrees recursively with minus R? Do you want to preserve special files like symbolic links with option minus R? Do you want to preserve timestamps, permission bits? Many of these can be grouped together with option minus A that essentially copies all the metadata available for a file to the other side as far as practical. For example, to uh, copy different user IDs to the other side, you will have to log in on the other side as the root user because only the root user will be able to uh, create files under arbitrary user IDs. Um, as a concrete example for doing a more elaborate backup, um, I tell rsync here that it should use SSH. That is nowadays the default, so this is not actually necessary unless you have, for example, a special version of SSH that on certain systems you may want to use. And we output here some verbose logging message. We copy all the metadata. We also specify that we, if a file doesn't exist in the source folder anymore, then we want to delete it at the remote end such that files that we intentionally deleted will actually be also be deleted at the other end. And any files that we either delete or overwrite, we can also ask it to keep a backup copy at the remote end. And we can tell it where to put the backup copy, for example, by specifying a backup directory. And we can specify that backup directory sh shall be in folder old. And then we use the current date, for example, with minute resolution um, in this ISO date format. And then we copy everything um, from, for example, this remote machine here into my backup copy. And this way we don't actually overwrite or delete files. We just move them into these backup directories. So no old version ever gets lost and we have snapshots of different times and you got a quite sophisticated uh, backup system for free as just a uh, extensions of this uh, quite powerful remote file copy tool rsync. So you may find that this is a, a very useful tool, for example, if you have to specify in a project proposal um, how you're going to make backups because in our projects, for example, we don't take ooh, my heart has died in the last minute as a uh, valid excuse. You are here to learn to deliver work even in the context of failing hardware. So planning your backup strategy, planning for hardware um, failures is an important part of the job.